As we continue our study of the Constitution and look at Article 2, we see the establishment of what may be the most powerful office on the face of the earth. And the founders were very concerned about this because once again, as James Madison put it, every word of it, that is the Constitution, decides a question of liberty and power. When you give power to government, you are in effect limiting the power of people. And so Article 2, dealing with the executive branch of government, Section 1 sets forth the term that presidents are to serve. It sets forth a single four-year term, but no limit on how many terms that the president can serve. The convention had originally voted for a two-term limit, but they noted that Washington, who it was generally thought would be the first president, voted against that limit. And so later on reconsideration, they decided to take that limit out. Washington was elected president. He served two terms, and at the end, he said that that really ought to be as much as anybody ought to serve. And that established the two-term limit as an informal tradition. That tradition persisted until 19... 30 or 1940, when Franklin D. Roosevelt, in a crisis of war and depression, sought a, and was elected to a third term, and then a fourth in 1944, and just a few weeks after taking office in 45, he died. And so at this point, people said, really, two terms is enough. And so the 22nd Amendment was then adopted, ratified by 1951, limiting the president to two terms of office. The president is chosen by an electoral college rather than by direct election of the population. There are some reasons for that. One, it gives the states a direct say in what goes on in the presidency. Now they have control to some extent in the executive branch as well as in Congress. Notice this checks and balances idea going on, the idea that each branch and each level of government is going to check the power of the other and keep the other in restraint. This concern that power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely underrides everything that we're talking about here. The Electoral College consists of delegates from each state, electors from each state, equal in number to the total number of congressmen and senators from that state. This gives the smaller states a little bit of an advantage there, but also means that these smaller states are not overlooked and ignored in the election process. Now, if no candidate receives a majority, then the race goes to Congress. And in the Congress, the House chooses the president, each state casting one vote as the majority of that state's congressmen desire. And the Senate chooses the vice president with one vote per senator. Notice that when we say when no candidate receives a majority, there is no second ballot in the Electoral College. You don't proceed and eliminate the first and go down to the top two or something like that. If no candidate receives a majority in the first ballot, we go right to Congress. In that sense, then, the Electoral College is a little bit of a check on federal power. It protects the smaller states against possible federal encroachment. And you notice one thing about the two-party system. It is a way of making sure that one candidate almost always receives a majority in the Electoral College. If we went to a multi-party system, then very likely in many elections, no one party, no one candidate would have a majority in the Electoral College, and elections would be decided by Congress, not the Electoral College then, which you might consider the implications of that for the whole concept of separation of powers. Then we come to Section 5. Now, I myself am a firm believer in the Lamaze method of childbirth. Our three children were born by that method. I was present at the time, and I recommend it highly particularly if you want your child to become president of the United States. Because if you look at Section 1, Clause 4, it says, no person except a natural-born citizen. <laughs> well, I believe in strict construction, but that's a little more strict than I think the Founding Fathers intended on that phrase. 
but they limited the president to one who is a natural-born citizen and who is at least 35 years old and who has been a resident of the United States for at least 14 years. You could be a citizen born abroad to American citizens, or you could have gone abroad to live for a number of years, but you have to have resided here for at least 14 years. Presidential succession then is provided in Section 5, and presidential succession has been altered a number of times by various amendments and by statute as well. I'm told that shortly after his election in 1992, President-elect Clinton was speaking to a group of high school students at Monticello. And one student asked him, if Thomas Jefferson were alive today, would you appoint him to a cabinet position, and if so, which one? And President-elect Clinton responded, if Thomas Jefferson were alive today, I would appoint him Secretary of State. And then Al Gore and I would resign so Jefferson could become president. Well, there's a problem with that. The commander-in-chief did not know his chain of command. Prior to 1967, that appears to be correct. But now it's provided that if both the president and vice president become vacant offices, then Congress, by law, establishes the succession. And as it is established right now, the Next president, if both offices were vacant, would be the Speaker of the House. If that becomes vacant, then the President pro tem of the Senate. And if that becomes vacant, then after that, we go to the cabinet officers according to the seniority of their departments. That means when each department was established. The first department to have been established was the Department of State, and so the Secretary of State would be next in line after the president pro tem of the Senate. Clause 6 then speaks about the president's salary. And as we go on to section 2 then, we see the power and duties of the president. The president is the commander-in-chief of the armed forces and of the state militias when they are called into federal service. Notice now that the power over the armed forces and over foreign affairs generally is a shared power between the President and Congress. Congress has the authority to declare war, but the President, of course, is going to be Commander-in-Chief during those operations. Congress has the authority to make rules and regulations for the armed forces, but the day-to-day -day commands are going to be given by the President. And so we see a shared power here in this sense. And it has been a subject of some tension here as to exactly where Congress's authority ends and the President's authority begins. Clearly, if a nuclear attack is launched in the United States and we have less than an hour from detection to decide whether we're going to respond or not, we can't convene a session of Congress to debate the matter. Somebody has to act and act quickly. Nor, when we speak about the power of Congress to declare war, do we probably mean that the President may never commit one soldier into a hostile situation without a formal congressional declaration. At the same time, I think a good argument could be made that the President cannot circumvent Congress and carry on a full-scale war just by calling it a police action or something like this. So where did the powers of Congress end and the powers of the President begin? In 1973, Congress proposed an answer to that in the War Powers Resolution, a resolution that was passed over a presidential veto and which no president since that time has recognized as valid. But essentially, the War Powers Resolution said that whenever the President commits troops into hostilities, he may do so for up to 60 days. And if during that 60 days, Congress orders the troops to be brought home, the President has to comply. If by the end of that 60 days, Congress hasn't either declared war or in some other way authorized this action or granted the President an extension of time, then the President has to withdraw the troops at the end of the 60 days with one qualification, and that's that if it's necessary for the troops' safety, he can have an additional 30 days to bring them home safely. 
Effectively, it means the president can commit troops for about 90 days without congressional approval. But no court has yet ruled on whether the War Powers Resolution is constitutional. And one of the reasons why in recent conflicts we have seen both Republican and Democratic administrations relying on UN resolutions rather than on their own powers is that they don't want to get into a possible constitutional crisis over the War Powers Resolution. If Congress passes a resolution saying, Mr. President, bring the troops home, if he's acting pursuant to a UN resolution, which has the status of a treaty under Article 6, Section 2, part of the supreme law of the land, the argument goes, he can then say to Congress, go fly a kite, I'm operating under a higher law than you. That's the argument behind it, and that is one of the reasons why we are seeing so many internationally undertaken actions today. Clause 2 says that the president may require the written opinion of cabinet officials, and these officials, of course, have the duty to administer their departments as well as to advise the president. He has the power to pardon offenses. Now, this is a very broad power. It includes the power to pardon not just violations of criminal statute, but also contempts of court as well. And the one exception is impeachment, and the reason for that exception is that the English king, many times after parliament would impeach an official, the king would just simply pardon the official and rehire him. But the president may pardon before charges are filed, or while a trial is in progress, after conviction, after a sentence is served, or even after the person has died. In fact, Alexander Hamilton in the Federalist Papers says one of the purposes is to prevent insurrection, to restore peace. He says the timing of a pardon can be very crucial. If there's a group of people creating an insurrection, a well-timed pardon, he said, might have the effect of restoring domestic tranquility. Another reason is to be a check on the judiciary. It's a means by which the executive branch checks the power of the courts, the power to pardon. And it's just simply a means of tempering justice with mercy. The president may make treaties with the concurrence of two-thirds of the senators. And the founding fathers did not include the concurrence of the House because they recognized, as John Jay makes clear in one of the Federalist Papers, number 64, that secrecy is essential in making treaties. After all, if the president is bargaining with the president of Iraq or of Saudi Arabia, if they can keep confidences and he cannot, obviously he's not going to be able to get into their negotiations. Now, as far as this requirement of a concurrence of two-thirds of the senators, there are two exceptions, and one is court-created, and that is commercial treaties, like the GATT Treaty or the NAFTA Treaty. These are not treaties, the courts have said. These, rather, are simply trade agreements. And therefore, they come within the power of Congress under Article I, Section 8, to regulate commerce with foreign nations and don't constitute an exercise of the treaty power. And then also the courts speak about executive agreements. The courts say that there are some types of agreements that the president may make with foreign nations, such as maybe the tariff on Argentine wheat for this month, that don't require the concurrence of the Senate. But these have the same legal force and effect as a treaty. Whether or not those court-appointed exceptions are valid is for you to determine, but at least that is the way the court has interpreted them. The president has the power to appoint Supreme Court justices and ambassadors and major federal officers with the advice and consent of the majority of the Senate. This is a simple majority this time, not a two-thirds. But both houses of Congress may pass legislation in which they authorize the president to appoint lower federal officials without having to go to the Senate. In other words, every time they want to hire a new clerk typist over in the Department of Education, they don't have to get Senate approval for it. Once again, this power to appoint, subject to Senate confirmation, is a congressional check on executive power and the power to appoint Supreme Court justices with confirmation is a check by both the, the legislature and the executive upon the judiciary. So once again, 
you see these checks and balances going back and forth. Part of the idea of this checks and balances comes from a man, by the way, whose name was John Witherspoon. Now, John Witherspoon was a Presbyterian minister, came over from Scotland to become president of the College of New Jersey, which you may have heard of. It's changed its name to Princeton. And he had about 25 students in each of his graduating class. He lived on campus with his students and got up early every morning with them and drilled them in law and rhetoric, as well as in Bible. He was a student of Montesquieu and of Blackstone and taught the idea of separation of powers to his students. But he emphasized something that came out of his own Calvinist background, and that's that you can't simply have these three branches of government separate and distinct from each other. If you do that, then each one of them is going to aggrandize more power to itself. Rather, they need to check and balance each other, Witherspoon said. Now, the significance of Witherspoon here, he was not at the Constitutional Convention. He was a signer of the Declaration of Independence and a member of the Continental Congress and a member of the New Jersey Ratifying Convention. But he was not at the Constitutional Convention except in spirit, because no less than nine of the delegates to the convention, about one-sixth, were Reverend Witherspoon's students. And one of these was James Madison, whom we sometimes call the father of the Constitution, who originally went to Princeton to study theology, stayed a full semester after graduation so he could study Hebrew and learn the Old Testament better under Reverend Witherspoon, read the Hebrew laws and institutions in the original language, and undoubtedly this affected his understanding of government. One other power here we should mention, the power to make interim or recess appointments. Well, the Senate is in recess, the president may appoint a justice or a cabinet official, and that person will then hold office until the Senate reconvenes and votes on whether or not to confirm that person. If they vote to confirm, then he's on for good. If they vote not to confirm, then he's off. If they don't do either, then he ceases to hold office when the Senate recesses again, although technically there is nothing here that would prevent the President from reappointing him as a new recess appointment the next day. Section 3 then sets forth powers and ceremonial duties for the President, the power to give information to Congress, which he commonly does in the State of the Union address. He may recommend legislation, however, somebody in Congress has to introduce it, the President cannot, and he can convene emergency sessions of Congress. He can receive ambassadors, he is required to faithfully execute all laws of the United States, and to commission all federal officers. And there they use substantially the same oath as is given for the President. I do solemnly swear or affirm that I will faithfully execute the office of President of the United States, and will, to the best of my ability, preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. George Washington, when he took that oath, added, so help me God. And that has remained a tradition ever since. Section 4 then provides for the impeachment power. It applies to the president, the vice president, and all civil officers. And the only grounds for impeachment are treason, and bribery, and other high crimes and misdemeanors. The procedure is that the House votes to impeach by a simple majority. Once the House votes to impeach, it goes to the Senate with the Chief Justice presiding. And the Senate then votes whether to remove the president or other official from office, and two-thirds are required to remove him. Against presidents, this has been used only twice. In 1868, the House, by a majority, voted to impeach Andrew Johnson, but the Senate fell one vote short of removing him. 35 voted to remove, 19 voted not to remove. If it had been 36 to 18, then he would have been removed. And then, of course, President Nixon, in 1974, resigned as the House prepared articles of impeachment. It's been used only 11 other times against federal officials, nine judges, one senator, and one cabinet official. Then we move on to Article 3, dealing with the judicial branch. Section 1 establishes the judicial branch and says that the judicial power shall be vested, and the idea of vested means to permanently rest. In other words, it's to reside there permanently. The idea that power that we, the people, have delegated to one branch 
cannot be redelegated to another branch of government. It shall be vested in one Supreme Court and such inferior courts as Congress may from time to time ordain and establish. Notice that the only court that is specifically mandated by the Constitution is the Supreme Court itself. The others, the federal district courts, the circuit courts of appeals, are adopted by congressional act. And if Congress wanted to, they could pass an act tomorrow abolishing the circuit courts of appeal and requiring that all appeals go directly from federal district court to the Supreme Court. Or if they wanted to, they could decide that maybe another interim level of appeals is needed between the circuit courts and the Supreme Court, so they could establish a special level like that. That is all within the discretion of Congress. Judges, we see, hold office during, notice the term, good behavior. Practically speaking, we interpret that to mean for life. We can impeach a judge if he engages in bad behavior, which would seem to be defined very similar to what we see for the president there, of treason, bribery, or other high crimes and misdemeanors. Simply holding views that we disagree with would probably not be a ground for impeachment. Why did they provide for judges holding office for life like this? The reason is they wanted them to be insulated from the political process. As Governor Morris, the man who did most of the final drafting of the Constitution put it, those who are charged with the important duties of administering justice should, if possible, depend only on God. Problem is, a lot of them today don't depend on God, and some of them even seem to think they are God. And we see further as a protection against interference by Congress with their decisions that the compensation of judges in the courts may not be diminished during that judge's tenure on the court. That means then Congress can't simply reduce the judge's salaries because they don't like their opinions. Section 2 sets forth the jurisdiction of the courts, provides that they shall have jurisdiction of all cases in law that is statute or equity, general principles of fairness, that arise under the Constitution or federal laws and treaties, that involve foreign officials, involve admiralty or maritime law, since usually states can't really handle those very well, involve controversies between states, or diversity of citizenship between citizens of different states or foreign nations, or suits between a state and a citizen of another state or nation. And that was changed by the 11th Amendment, which provided that a state may not be sued in that manner without its consent. They then specify two types of jurisdiction. One is original jurisdiction, where you would take your case directly to the Supreme Court. This is a very narrow range of cases involving foreign ambassadors and consuls. The court shall have appellate jurisdiction. That is, you try your case in the lower court, and if you're not satisfied, then you appeal it up to the Supreme Court. In all other cases, the court shall have appellate jurisdiction, with such exceptions as Congress shall make. Notice that here is an important check on the Supreme Court. Congress can limit the court's appellate jurisdiction. This is a check the framers placed on the Supreme Court, but it's a check that we have not used in well over a hundred years. Personally, I thought a good opportunity to use a check like this involved the flag burning decisions back in 1989. Remember, there was question as to whether to amend the Constitution to provide protection for flag-burning statutes. And there were others who said, no, a statute is all we really need. They turned out to be wrong. The Congress adopted a statute, and the statute was struck down by the Supreme Court by the same 5-4 vote and the same reasoning as the Texas statute had been a year earlier. My suggestion at the time is, why don't you just simply pass a federal statute, much like the one that you did pass, and then just add one little clause at the end of that saying the jurisdiction of the Supreme Court over criminal prosecutions arising under this statute or similar state statutes is hereby rescinded. And the Supreme Court would be out of the picture on flag burning cases. That is not meddling with the court. That is a check that the framers placed on the court and a check that they intended that we use from time to time. I think the time has come to use it. Clause 3 then speaks about the right to trial by jury and preserves it to be in the jurisdiction in the state where the crime is allegedly committed. 
partly a reaction against the practice of England to take people back to England to be tried for crimes allegedly committed in the United States. Section 3 then speaks about treason. Notice some language here. Treason against the United States shall consist only in levying war against them or in adhering to their enemies, giving them aid and comfort. Several things to notice. First of all, in England, one could be convicted of having treasonous thoughts. Even if you hadn't done anything about it, if it was thought that you harbored treason in your heart against the king, you could be executed for treason. Americans emphasized liberty of conscience, and particularly that was a Puritan emphasis, the idea that every person is responsible before God for the condition of his own soul. Fascinating book written by John Van Teel, Liberty of Conscience, the History of a Puritan Idea, one that I recommend very highly. But in America, we said, no, there has to be action, not just thought. That's why they say treason shall consist only in levying war or giving aid and comfort to our enemies. Notice also the reference to the plural. Notice how they speak of the United States not as it, but as them. They saw this nation as a union of states. If we were to use the language today, let's say we were to say, the United States blank going to war. Would we say is going to war or would we say are going to war? Most people today would say is. Before the war between the states, the usage would be the United States are going to war because we thought of ourselves as a union of states. Gradually between the war between the states and World War I, the language changed, and as the language changes, often that represents change as a thought. And as the usage changed to the United States is going to war, I'm not saying that was so much a cause as a reflection, we began to think of ourselves more as a federal unity with just a number of states as kind of administrative subdivisions. Then we speak about the evidence that is needed for a conviction. Two witnesses or a confession in open court. Where did the framers get an idea like that? Straight out of Deuteronomy 17.6. In the mouth of two or three witnesses, let everything be established. And we see further that Congress shall fix the penalty for treason by federal statute. But it may not include corruption of blood. Now, corruption of blood is not a reference to AIDS. Corruption of blood simply means that one's citizenship or inheritance rights may not be affected by one's conviction of treason. And this, again, is a biblical principle, the principle of Deuteronomy 24.16, a practice common to what we see in the pagan societies where if you were committed of, or convicted of an offense, not only you but your whole family would be executed with you. But according to Jewish law, Deuteronomy 24.16, the fathers shall not be put to death for the sins of the children or the children for the sins of the fathers. Each one shall be put to death for his own sin. That's a principle of biblical law and one that the framers implemented here in Article 3.